the biggest concern is going to be uh, if we do get in a recession uh, situation or it drags on longer, that's certainly going to have an impact both on rent growth and then tenants' uh, ability to meet those rents. Welcome to Buzz House, a vacant utility podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. Back into the Buzz House today to give some highlights from his team's quarterly report, which covers multifamily housing, among other real estate asset classes. Our guest today is Brent Meyer, a colleague of ours at Baker Tilly, who's a principal in charge of Baker Tilly's Transaction Advisory Group. Brent is a repeat guest. I think Brent is probably three or four times with us now, so thanks for bearing with us coming back. We'll be talking to him today on what he and his team have observed for quarter two here in 2022 in the multifamily housing industry. Before we dive into that discussion with Brent, we want to give you a few legislative and industry updates. On August 12th, the House, of course, passed the Inflation Reduction Act legislation, which the Senate had passed earlier in the week. There are no specific provisions included from the Affordable Housing Improvement Act, but there are definitely a few provisions around energy that can be beneficial for your multifamily projects. The first one we'll briefly mention is the 45L Energy Efficiency Credit, which Derek and I have talked about in general previously, which is the potential credit for multifamily projects, which are three stories or less. A big change with this credit is if the project does indeed qualify for the credit, it will no longer reduce your light tick eligible basis. That was always a concern with deals without excess basis. Similarly, for the investment tax credits, which is used in conjunction with solar panels, there will no longer reduce the light tick eligible basis. Again, solar was reducing our eligible basis and hurting in our calculations when driving light tick credits. In addition, the act provides for a 20% bonus for ITC facilities used in conjunction with the covered affordable housing programs, and also a 10% bonus for ITC facilities in low-income communities. So whereas, of course, the solar credit that you've used previously was you know, 20, maybe a little bit more than 20% and actually decreasing, you may get a credit for possibly up to 50 to 60% of qualifying uh, expenditures without reducing light tick basis. So a great benefit for your local housing tax credit projects. Another quick note on the act of the funds that are available, $42.5 million can be used by HUD for energy and water benchmarking of properties that are eligible to receive grants or loans, regardless of whether they actually receive such grants or loans. So again, so HUD may come out with some other green uh, energy uh, programs. Just a quick note that members of Congress will be in their districts the first and last week of October. So if you have projects you want to be showing them, again, the first and last week of October uh, for members of Congress. In other news, the Treasury recently released guidance on state and local recovery funds, whereby the state HFA, city or county may now directly loan the SLRF funds to a loan income housing tax credit project and not be concerned with matters about having to be a short-term loan or blending funds to meet the previous requirements. This will greatly, greatly simplify the process for bringing SLRF funds into these light tick projects, which have been facing large gaps. This loan structure can be used as long as units are targeted tenants earning 65% or less of the area median income or lower for a minimum of 20 years. So again, SLRF, much easier to use with the recent Treasury legislation. A quick update, of course, maybe you remember the infrastructure bill which passed earlier in the year. Recently, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack announced that the department is investing $401 million to provide access to high-speed internet for 31000 rural residents and businesses in 11 states. The states that were affected are Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Nevada, North Dakota, and Texas. So kind of keep watching that. They'll uh, really helping with broadband and so forth, a a key item in in rural communities. Uh, Lastly, uh, big news in the state local housing tax credit world. Legislation was recently enacted in Virginia that will increase the annual allocation of state-level loan housing tax credits from $15 million per year to $60 million per year, so four times increase. 
With that, 20 million annually will be allocated to properties in towns with populations of 35,000 or fewer. So again, targeting the non-major metropolitan areas. So big, big increase in state credits in Virginia. So a lot of a lot of uh, impactful legislation here the last the last handful of weeks. With that and this background information, Garrick and I are now going to jump into our discussion with Brent. Uh, Garrick. Thanks, Don. And Brent, thanks for being on our uh, podcast once again. So for those listeners who may not have been introduced to you from our last visit to Buzz House, why don't you start out by letting our listeners know about your background and what you are working on in Baker Tilly's Transaction Advisory Group? Thanks, Garrick, and thanks, Don, for having me back on the Buzz House. Always a pleasure to be here with both of you. Yeah, my background, so I've been in the real estate industry for over 20 years, providing transaction, valuation, appraisal, and advisory in and around real estate transactions. Our team does the same. We've expanded the team substantially over the last year and have really hit a cadence with our uh, real estate market report that we put out every quarter. Um, So thanks to all of you and your interest in our report, and we look forward to our conversation. Thanks for that intro, Brent. So would you be able to start our discussion giving an overview of some of the macroeconomic statistics, perhaps around unemployment rates and inflation from your report? And I know you mentioned that you don't necessarily track any constructional material pricing in your report, but maybe if you have any insight on where you're seeing that trend. Sure. So let's just kind of break it down by each topic. So first of all, inflation hit a 40-year high in June, as we reported in our report, and it eased slightly in July. So it was 9.1% uh, year over year in June, um, and it came down to, I think, around 8.5% in July. So that's good news that inflation is easing, but I think there's still some concern um, as we look out into the future the volatile prices in energy. Gas prices are still, Wall Street Journal reported last week that gas is up almost 45% since last year, which is actually down since June 8%. So it actually was much higher in June than it was July. Um, And part of that is the release of the oil from our strategic reserve. So really we would view that as a temporary solution to what could be a, a problem going out. And energy is elevated for for many reasons. One, the the geopolitical situation worldwide, as well as, in my view, what the U.S. has done to restrict or uh, prohibit producers from producing oil and gas um, domestically. So they severely have prohibited those producers from uh, increasing their output. And then as far as unemployment rates, we had some good news. Unemployment actually came down from 36 the 3.5%, which on the surface sounds like really good news. But again, there's some some trouble in the waters here. One being the labor participation rate is still below what it was in February of 2020, uh, meaning not as many people are participating in the workforce. And the reason that's troubling is um, along with inflation, we've seen robust uh, wage increases. However, what's happening is the wage increases are not necessarily keeping up with inflation. So really you have a net decrease in your uh, take home earnings. Um, So that could be leading to why we see a decrease in the labor participation. Um, The other maybe troubling sign that we're kind of monitoring is the, the number of job openings. Historically, the U S has had, you know, somewhere in the, in the range of 4 million job openings increased substantially in 20 and 2021 to something in the neighborhood of, 11 million. It was 11.3 million as recently as earlier this year. And uh, that number has decreased, although slightly, but has decreased to 10.7 million in the latest report from the Wall Street Journal last week. So there's a lot going on and it's we're not really sure what the outlet look looks like, but it is uh, a little bit concerning. Well, Brent, thanks for that uh, summary. And switching to the multifamily market, what are your observations on rent growth and, and vacancy there? So we have seen rent growth decelerate, meaning um, the annual increase has decreased substantially, and I would say quicker than anticipated. And I think part of that is the increase across the board. And, you know, we did have a decrease in our GDP from Q1 to Q2. Um, so that's two quarters in a row. And by some measures, um, that would define uh, a recession. 
And so I think there's some concern there. We've also seen a slight tick down in occupancy since the third quarter of last year as more units have come online. So I would say, you know, there there is a little bit of concern in the rent growth, although we're still above kind of historical norms. Thank you very much for those uh, great insights, Brent. In, in, in what you're seeing and hearing, is there any concern again, you know, from, from the rent growth we've seen? And, and you, you mentioned this, vacancies up just a tad. For tenants to be able to pay these rents, of course, wages aren't growing as, as quickly as rents. Any general discussion, or maybe that's your point on kind of a little bit, a little bit higher vacancy? There is concern, but it's going to be uh, more targeted. I think the biggest concern is going to be uh, if we do get in a recession uh, situation or it drags on longer, that's certainly going to have an impact both on rent growth and then tenants' uh, ability to meet those rents. And the other thing is household formation is going to decrease, meaning those that are coming out of school or in that 20 to 30 bracket are going to double up, move back home, whatever it is, decreasing the demand for certain units. You know, I think Class A highly sought after properties in prime locations may do all right, but I think it's going to be a challenge for some of the other tertiary or Class B and C properties. Thanks, Brent. It's it's such a domino effect, right? So let's move to more of of a different topic. So we're anecdotally seeing delays in uh, projects from entitlements, permitting, you know, getting projects to balance on sources and uses. What are you actually hearing around delays within this area? Well, again, it's multifaceted. There's still issues and challenges within the supply chain and logistically, right, getting the materials to the site. And Garrick, as you brought up earlier in our conversation, the delay with the one factory that generated glue um, in that area, right? So we're seeing those um, kind of across the board. The other one on the sources and uses side is getting these deals to paper out. Um, So rent growth is decelerating, but unfortunately, the cost of capital or the cost of debt is increasing. And if they're not increasing, the banks are certainly, their underwriting is becoming more rigid and and you can't always get the lenders to get to the same page as as maybe the equity. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that in a lot of projects right now. But what about, what are you seeing as far as, you know, large multifamily transactions in the market in the second quarter since we're on that topic? As we noted in our report, there are some uh, marquee transactions out there, some very large, significant um, transactions. And I think what's driving that is that there is still a lot of capital out there chasing yield. And multifamily is a great place to park your capital because it is quickly adjusted. And you can quickly adjust for inflation um, and increase those rents. But I think that's one driver into the multifamily market. No, and uh, with that, we want to thank Brent for joining the Buzz House again today for the second quarter updates. And listeners, thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com.